This is our fourth and final video lecture covering regression analysis in chapter 12, simple linear regression analysis. And in this video, what we're going to do is extend the discussion and our example, and indeed the, the checkpoint questions as well, to cover a couple of, of additional important topics. The first topic that we're going to talk about is prediction or estimation, so basically forecasting. And in this chapter, I'm going to teach you how to put together a confidence interval for a prediction or a forecast. So a confidence interval is an interval estimate of the mean value of y for a given value of x. And coming up with a point estimate for, um, for the confidence interval is, is, is really simple. But we're going to want to attach a level of degree of certainty to our forecast so we're going to come up with a confidence interval using the same types of techniques that we used several chapters ago when we built confidence intervals for the mean and for the, and for the, um, and for the sample proportion and the sample mean. So um, you know, we use the sample mean and the sample proportion as point estimators, and then we came up with confidence intervals for the population parameters. We're going to do something very similar to that here. The equations will look a little bit different, but the approach is, is pretty much the same. So... Um, the, a prediction interval is going to be used whenever we want to predict an individual value of y okay, for a new observation uh, corresponding to a given value of x. Okay. So with a confidence interval, we have an interval estimate of the mean value of y for a given value of x. So you, you look at this and you probably think, well, what's, you know, what is the difference? Well, the difference is, is that, and sometimes this is called an in-sample versus an out-of-sample prediction or forecast. So if we're, if we're going to go uh, and try to calculate the mean value of y, what, what we'll see is that there's really you know, one source of variation that we have to account for when we build our confidence interval for y. And that is the fact that there's variation in the betas when we estimate them. Right, the beta is a random variable, so we have to account for the variation in the betas. Right, I mean they're expected to be equal to the true population parameters on average, but you know every time we sample, we'll get different estimates, and that's going to lead to some uncertainty in our prediction. But we won't have to worry about the the uh, the variance of the error term if we're predicting the mean value of y, because we know that the expected value of the error term is equal to zero. So on average, that, that's equal to zero. When we do a prediction interval, though, what's often called an out-of-sample prediction or an out-of-sample forecast, we're going to have both sources of variation because we're trying to predict a, a particular individual value of y. And we can't ignore the, um, we can't ignore the standard deviation of the error term if we're going to try to predict an individual value of y. That in, we can't just take it to be equal to zero because we're not dealing with the average. We're dealing with a specific forecast. And so for that reason, the margin of error in our confidence interval is going to be larger when we do out-of-sample prediction than in-sample prediction, or when we do what your textbook calls a prediction interval rather than a confidence interval. Okay, so let's work through that. So the confidence interval... Um, is, is stated, them using exactly the terminology that's in your textbook, as y hat star, right, is the estimate of y hat. And the star here is new, that little asterisk up here. That's new because what it's signifying is that this is, this is something that we've actually predicted now, right? So this is, an, in a sense, a forecast, okay? And so it's going to be equal to our point estimate, which is y hat star, right, plus or minus a margin of error. It's the same formula that we used before. So here's our margin of error. Our margin of error is based on t alpha over 2 because we have, you know, both sides of the distribution to worry about, right? This confidence interval is going to account for the fact that we could be either underestimating y hat or overestimating one or the other. So it's always going to be alpha over 2. So t alpha over 2 multiplied by uh, the standard uh, deviation of y hat star. So we have to worry about how to calculate that, and I'll show you the formulas. Okay, So this is the confidence interval. This, this margin of error is going to be smaller than the margin of error that we calculate down here. 
So the margin of error that we calculate down here, you know, our, our forecast out of sample or our prediction interval, the point estimate is going to be exactly the same as what we find and use up here when we do the confidence interval. It's the margin of error that's different. This margin of error is going to be different and, and bigger than the margin of error that we calculate in the example above when we do confidence intervals. And that's going to be the same T alpha over 2, but S pred, which stands for the subscript pred is for prediction, um, that is going to be a larger standard uh, deviation than what we find when we use S sub y hat star here. Okay, but we'll be able to compare the two formulas. You'll be able to easily see that when we account for the variation in the error term in the second case with prediction, that unambiguously we're going to have an S which is bigger than when we calculate S y hat star. It's actually pretty straightforward. Now, when we, when we do these confidence intervals, of course, we're going to want to think about you know, the level of confidence, the confidence coefficient, 1 minus alpha. Standard 1 minus alphas would be like a 99% confidence interval where alpha is equal to 1%, a 95% confidence interval with alpha equal to 5%, or indeed a 90% you know, confidence interval with alpha equal to 10%. Those would be standard. Okay. Now, we're, gonna, we're dealing with T in these formulas, so I'll remind you that the T that we're dealing with is the T distribution that's associated with N minus 2 degrees of freedom. Right, just, just like when we were doing the t-test. The so let's put this to work. Let's do a point estimate. If we have three TV ads that we run prior to a sale, what would we expect the mean number of cars to, sold to be? So in this sense, we're looking for the average number of cars. So we're saying, look, if I were to run three TV ads over and over and over again, a large number of times, on average, right? How many cars would I expect to sell? So because I'm, I'm, I'm asking this question such that I'm running three ads over and over and over again, I can think about the expected value of the error term here, right? The average error term in that case of, would be equal to zero. And I don't have to worry about the variation that's associated with the error term. I can forget that. The only variation that's going to enter in to my forecast is the fact that if I were to collect a different sample of data, than I actually use to, re, uh, to estimate this regression model, 10 plus 5x, you know, I might get slightly different parameters for 10 and 5 because I have a different sample. So that variation I'm going to need to account for when I do my, my uh, prediction, uh, not my prediction interval, but my, um, my confidence interval um, for, this, for this forecast. So when I estimate the standard deviation of y hat, okay, so go back to the previous slide. You know, y hat star is easy to calculate. It's just 25 cars. You know, I've got three ads. For every ad, my regression model, the predictable part of my regression model, tells me that I should sell three times five or 15 cars. The intercept is equal to 10. So if I didn't sell, if I didn't sell, if I, if I didn't run any ads, I'd still expect to sell, you know, 10 cars. So I expect the number of cars to be sold to be 25. But now I need to add and subtract a margin of error to that 25. And here is the estimate for the standard deviation of y hat star. Okay, and, and it's a pretty simple formula to use. And again, I mean, it's something that you can use by hand. But I mean, you know, I would recommend using a computer package to make these calculations. But if we use Excel, we're going to have to do it, not necessarily by hand, but we're going to have to actually program or you know, write these formulas into Excel. Uh, but you'll notice that this formula depends on S, right? That's the standard error of the estimate. That's the, that's the sample data you, uh, residuals, the residuals from the, from, the, uh, from the regression analysis used to estimate the standard deviation of the population error term. So this is something we've talked about before. We multiply that by the square root of one over N and is the sample size, and we've added to that um, x star minus x bar squared, where x star is the value of x that we're trying to forecast at. So in our example, x star would be equal to 3, right? And then in the denominator here, we've taken every single value of x in our data set, all five values, subtracted the mean from them, squared them, and added them all up. So just so you see how this formula works and how simple it really is, 
right? I've done, I've actually done this work for you down here. So the, uh, the standard error of the estimate for our simple five data point regression analysis is 2.16025, okay? And I multiply that by the square root of one over five. My sample size was five. I took the value that I'm predicting at, which is three, that's X star, minus two, which is X bar, the average number of, of uh, advertisements for remember is two in the data set. Square that and divide it by, you know, the, the first observation, which had one ad minus the average of two squared, plus the second observation, which had three ads minus two, square that, et cetera, for all five observations. And then, you know, simplify, put it into your calculator or into Excel, and you'll find out that the margin of error is 1.4491. So now we need to put that together with the point estimate and the appropriate T-score in order to come up with a confidence interval. Remember, confidence intervals are always the point estimate plus or minus a margin of error. This is a key component of the margin of error. So here it is. 95% confidence interval is, of course, going to be determined by the level of T that we choose. So, you know, going to a, a T table with N minus 2, that's 5 minus 2, 3 degrees of freedom, um, and looking up T alpha over 2, so 95%, that's 5% in both tails, that's 2.5 in, in each tail. So the value of T with 3 degrees of freedom where there's 2.5% left in the upper tail is 3.1824. That's a key component of the margin of error, and I multiply that by 1.4491, which I calculated on the previous slide. So what's the forecast for the average number of cars sold with three TV ads run the week before? 25. Margin of error, 4.61. So 25, eh, you know, if you want to be 95% 90, uh, confident um, that your interval, if you were to, to, to repeat this type of exercise, that your interval would include the true number of cars sold, you know, you would have 25 cars plus or minus 4.61 cars. So... That would be an interval of 20.39 cars to 29.61 cars. Okay. So, I mean, I suppose if I were explaining this to somebody in management or something, they would say, what does it mean to sell 0.39 cars? Yeah, that might be a little bit of a pain, so I might round this and say, well, you know, 20 cars to 30 cars or something, just to, you know, just not to have to get, you know, caught up in, and explaining um, the nuances of, of interpreting the confidence interval to somebody who doesn't have a strong statistics background. Uh, but anyway, the, there's the answer, 20.39 to 29.61. Okay, let's talk about a prediction interval. So rather than trying to forecast and come up with a confidence interval for the average number of cars sold when we run three ads, right? Let's think about a specific sale next week. You know, next week we're going to um, have a sale, an auto sale, and we are going to run three TV ads this weekend. Okay, let's forecast how many cars we'll sell and come up with a confidence interval for it. Okay, that's a different question than the one we asked before because this is one specific sale that we're trying to forecast the results of. And before we were able, because we were dealing with averages, we were able to assume the expected value of E was equal to zero. And we didn't have to worry about the variation that was introduced um, and the errors that were introduced by the error term, because on average they're equal to zero. Not the case here, right? We can't do that now, okay? And so this changes the formula for the standard uh, deviation um, of the, the predicted value because we've got a one here under the square root. That's the only difference between this formula for the standard deviation, right, compared of, of the prediction compared to what we had before when we just did the straight confidence interval for the average. So, I mean, you can imagine that what the, if you were to take this S and bring it inside, it would be an S squared. So what you're literally doing is just adding the, uh, the sample estimate of the, the of the variance of E. Remember the variance of E, variance of 
e is equal to that sigma squared. And our best estimate of that is s squared. And we're just directly adding s squared under the square root here. And that's basically what we're doing. But, you know, we've taken it out of the square root here so it doesn't have the square root associated with it. So that, I mean, that's what we, that, that's really what we have here. Um, and so we've just basically linearly tacked on that s squared to our, our standard deviation of the prediction so that we come up unambiguously with a larger and wider confidence interval than we had before. So now plugging all the data in, it's going to look exactly like what we had before, except that there's this one here under the square root. So when I calculate S pred, S sub pred, I get 2.6013, which is definitely bigger than the standard uh, error that we had before. We can back up and see what it was. I don't remember what it was. Oh, it was 1.4491 right there, right? So now it's 2.6031, which will give us a wider confidence interval. So now we have Y hat star. Y hat star, you know, being estimated, you know, centering our, our, uh, our, Confidence interval on exactly the same point, 25, that hasn't changed, right? 3.1824 hasn't changed. It's still a 95% confidence interval, okay? But this number has changed and gotten bigger. Now it's 25 cars plus or minus 8.28 cars, okay? So our 95% confidence interval is 16.72 to 33.28 cars, so if we want to be, you know, 95% confident, you know, make a statement, be 95% confident that the number of cars we sell on a particular date is going to, you know, be within that confidence interval, it's going to be 16.72 cars to 33.28 cars. It's a pretty widespread for a 95% for a confidence interval, right? Eight cars is a lot of cars when you're a car salesman. Uh, let's let you... Uh, take a shot at, at implementing some of these concepts in the checkpoint questions. Okay, welcome back. Um, the last topic I want to run through very quickly with you is a diagnostic tool called residual analysis. We outlined a number of assumptions that have to be satisfied in order to fully implement um, ordinary least squares regression analysis, simple linear regression analysis. And one of the most important things that you should do when you're done estimating your model, and I would recommend doing this before you jump into any inference and, and um, hypothesis testing too, I'm only covering this last because it's covered last in this chapter of your textbook, but really this is a step that you should do right after you estimate the model, really. Um, and uh, you know what you do is you do a, an analysis of the residuals, and what you're looking for is to make sure that there's no identifiable pattern in the residuals. So remember that the residuals are your best, the sample's best guess at the value of E. And we have a number of assumptions about E that we made that has an expected value of zero and a constant variance, right? You know, that is, that, you know, that um, uh, I was going to use the term, you know, white noise, but I haven't really defined that. But basically, that it's random. Let me put it that way. That E is just random and it has an average unpredictable value, uh, you know, in any one observation, it's unpredictable and on average it's equal to zero. Let me put it that way. Okay, and you want to make sure that that looks like it, it, it meets the, um, uh, that our, our actual sample results meet those criteria. And the easiest way to do that, there are formal tests for these types of things too, hypothesis tests, but they're beyond the scope of our class. And so what we'll do is we'll just, uh, just do what, and it's, this is really a powerful procedure anyway, is just to plot the residuals. They provide information about E. So the residual for a particular observation, we already know, is equal to the actual value that the dependent variable takes on minus what the model predicts it should be. Okay, and so residual analysis here is going to be based on a graphical plot. So we're going to plot these residuals, and we're going to plot them against the value of X. Okay, so if the assumption that the variance of E is the same for all various uh, values of X, that was our last key Gauss-Markov assumption that we made, right? And the assumed regression of model is an adequate representation of the relationship between the variables, then the residual plot should give the overall impression 
of a horizontal band of points without any identifiable pattern in them. So that's what we're going to be looking for. I would call this a, a, a necessary but not sufficient condition for having a well-specified regression model. And I think in reality, you know, you should go beyond the tools that we can cover in this class. But this is the, the most important one that we're going to cover. So if you have a non-constant variance and you have x, your, your um, explanatory variable, your independent variable, on, on this axis, and you've got your residual on the horizontal axis right up here, and you see there's sort of this pattern where, you know, the residuals kind of spread out or narrow down as you move from the left to the right, then there's a pattern in the residuals that, that suggests that that assumption of a constant variance for the error term is not being satisfied. Now, again, there are, there are techniques if that happens. It may be a misspecified model and you need to add additional variables. That may not be the case. It may be that the data needs to be transformed in some way so that you have a constant variance. That's a technique called uh, generalized least squares, feasible generalized least squares. Um, that's beyond the scope of this course, but there are techniques that you can use to transform the data and, and, uh, and, and get the variance to be well behaved, right? But you should, you should be aware that if you have, like, it's kind of like a shotgun pattern, it looks like birdshot coming out of a shotgun. If you have that type of a pattern in your residuals, you know, it really, uh, it really casts doubt on your hypothesis test. Now, this by itself doesn't mean that you have biased estimates of, of beta naught of B, of, uh, and beta one in, in B0 and B1. You know, you, you can still have, particularly with a big sample, perfectly consistent uh, estimates of, of B0 and B1. What this really throws off is, is your um, estimation of the standard deviations of the sampling distributions. It biases those, and so it throws off all your hypothesis testing, which is a problem if you're interested in inference, which, you know, I am, okay? You could also have this sort of a, pattern the residuals where the residuals kind of swing down in a u-shape or you know you can imagine that they might come up and then fall this is going to suggest that you probably need to have a different functional form for the model could be some other variable that's omitted or it could just be a functional form for example we might want to add a, a variable to the model that's not just x but maybe x squared to capture that nonlinearity. that's a topic that we'll talk about uh, in the next chapter, how to capture a nonlinearity by adding a quadratic term into the regression analysis. Right now, suffice it to say that that's not a pattern that looks very healthy, okay? We would want a much more random looking pattern if we were going to be satisfied with, with our estimated model. So this is all about diagnostics. Hopefully, this is what we see. These are some really nice looking diagnostic results. Right? They're all centered around zero, and they're just kind of randomly scattered around zero. That's what we're hoping for. Now, in our you know, very simple five data point example for read auto, um, we can go ahead and plot the residuals. So I have five observations. Okay? These are my predicted car sales. The difference between my actual and predicted are my residuals. Here they are right here. So I'm going to plot these residuals on the horizontal axis, and I'm going to plot those against the value of, of x, the number of, of ads that were run. Right, so here's TV ads, and here are the residuals, and they look pretty random to me. Here's zero. You know, it kind of goes right through the middle here, and I don't really see too much of a discernible pattern. There really aren't enough data points here, though, to determine. Maybe if I had more data points, yeah, I might conclude that there was some nonlinearity in here or something. Kind of hard to tell with five data points, but you know that looks okay given that you know this is a, a pedagogical video, um, and we're going to be extending our our tools of analysis considerably in the in the next and last chapter. So go ahead. I've got a couple more questions for you here just to wrap up chapter twelve, uh, and then we will we will extend most of what we've learned in chapter twelve in chapter thirteen. But it'll be a lot less work because almost everything that we've learned here is, is directly transferable to the multiple regression analysis with very minor changes.